Hello. I'm very excited today to bring a very special guest, an elder, a brother, an amazing contributor to the positive things that need to happen in the world. And I want to tell you who he is. He's here. You can see him. Mendahi Crescencio Bastida Munoz. And Mendahi is the director of the Original Nations Program of the Fountain. And until July 2020, he was the director of the Original Caretakers Center for Earth Ethics, Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York since 2017, and general coordinator coordination of the Otomi Ototec Regional Council in Mexico. He is a caretaker of the philosophy and the traditions of the Otomi Toltec peoples and has been an Otomi Toltec ritual ceremony officer since 1988. He's a consultant with UNESCO around sacred sites, bicultural issues, and for other UN programs. He's been on numerous commissions and summits, and, and that'll all be in the writing that you can read at the website. Um, he has written on the relation between state and indigenous peoples, intercultural education, collective intellectual property rights, and associated traditional knowledge, bicultural sacred sites, and other topics. Um, he is author of several books, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, some of that wonderful sharing of what, what is happening uh, regarding divine remembrance of lineage relations and sacred sites. And I think one of the um, the things that I would want to make sure you know, just because it's important uh, pro pop, um, prophecy that has come to life, is he's the grand convener of the Grand Council of the Eagle and the Condor. And a, I will give you in the website, you can find him, and we'll say that again later, but at the eartheelders.org, eartheelders.org, and that's where you'll be able to find him, more information about him. So welcome, Mendahi. I know that's a lot uh, to say, and there's so much more I could say about you. But um, what I'd like to do is start like somewhat at the beginning. That name, Mendahi Crescencio Bastida Munoz. Can you tell me a little bit about where do, where does your name come from and how do you feel about it, their connection? Uh, first of all, thank you so much, mm -hmm. uh, Anita, Anita Sanchez, um, sister and very close friend. And um, I've been very honored to be in your presence uh, sometimes. Last time we were in Hawaii sharing. And of course, online, many, many uh, online gatherings. So for yes. me, it's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, to be invited to this program, to this podcast. So uh, my name is Mindaji, Mindaji Bastida Muñoz. And uh, this is from Otomi Toltec uh, Roots. Mindaji stands for the one who comes uh, with the wind. And uh, it's a um, great uh, honor to hold that name because Mindahi with the, with the wind is coming together and uh, it's a sacred element of life. So every time in our lineages, in our, our um, presence in this world, we are related to some elements some uh, mountains, some animals, some minerals. And that's how we relate, because we are uh, just uh, the reflection of this world, the reflection of the sacred elements. So for some uh, people, uh, they stand for, for some uh, lineages around the animals, the bear, the eagle, and other sacred animals. So. In this region in central Mexico, I was born in a very small community before it was an island. Uh, the original name is uh, Meshvi. And then when the Nahuas came here, it was called Tultepec. And when the Spaniards came here, came here they, didn't, they couldn't pronounce either the Otomi, Toltec, or the Nahuatl. So they called uh, Tultepec, but they added uh, another name like San Pedro, the saint of uh, Saint Peter, San Pedro. 
because this was an island where people used to uh, to gather, to hunt, to pick up, and you know, especially uh, for fishing. And because San Pedro, you know, San Peter was uh, the man for the, he was known as, as fishermen of souls. So they, the, the one who came and supposedly um, um, came to give a, a name to my community, uh, he chose this name. So that's why my community now is known as San Pedro Tultepec in the municipality of Lerma in the Toluca Valley. And the Toluca Valley, um, before it was known as, as Zambata. Uh, Zambata stands for Zana and Bati, the Valley of the Moon. Oh, nice. Yes. And then now, because it's, it's really beautiful how, how these uh, uh, names are, we are recovering those names, the original names. Because in remembering who we are and recovering the original names, then we know who we are. Yes. And just let me tell you that my name in, in the origins was not known, was not accepted. I had to sue the civil um, uh, judge in, in this area to acknowledge my name when I was already grown up. So uh, before even, you know, when you were baptized in the churches, they had they were putting your saint names. Yes, it was also in the civil in the civil rights. They didn't acknowledge the ancestral names, but we are fighting back. Now my my children, I can say, I I, I have two children. Uh, she's twenty one years old, and her name is Shiye. Yes. Shiye Bastida. Yes, I have the honor of knowing her. Yes. And, uh, and it's an uh, original name from the beginning. And Shige stands for, Shige Beara, but Shige uh, stands for the rain, soft rain. And Danzaki, Danzaki means uh, the, the force of the universe, which in, in other words is the universe. Is the Danzaki is the, the energy. So we are recovering. Those names. It's so, yeah, I can see you smiling as you say we're recovering because it means a lot. Just even the, the intonation, the connection, the relationship to have that back to know who you are. I, I really relate to that. Um, and, um, my family's in the same process, so I can understand. So, um, thank you. I didn't know any of that about you, even though I've known you for a number of years, but I didn't know where it came from. And, uh, one day I, I want to go to your, um, your village, and meet some of your people. That would be really wonderful. Uh, what I want to do is have you just say something about what, do you, what is it that you're focused on, um, and perhaps what you may have already brought that from a childhood. So a childhood story that maybe relates to what you're doing now, and then we can really just get into what it is that you're focused on and what you want people to know. Yes, I have been uh, walking in two different uh, cosmovisions in two different ways of being because uh, when colonization happened here in the Toluca Valley was in the early years um, in the 16th century. Actually, we have a temple, Catholic temple here that was built in uh, 16, not 15, uh, 25. Very early. Yeah. Yes. 1625, so, you said. Okay. Yeah. When uh, Vasco de Quiroga, one of the encomenderos, one of the priests and bishops, came to these lands and he was uh, giving names to several places. He, he really liked the places with water. As I, I told you, my community in San Pedro Tultepec was an island surrounded by waters. Uh, which gave birth to the longest river in Mexico, uh, which is called Lerma River. Now Lerma River. Before it was called Dante, and it's called Dante in our, our prayers. 
until today. So uh, what I'm telling you that is that uh, when I was growing up, I grew up already with that ecocide impact because uh, Mexico City was very thirsty after the revolution and they took the waters to supply Mexico City uh, through um, a system uh, that uh, could carry, you know, uh, a channel. Could mm -hmm. carry. Until today, ever since 1952, they began to, to bring out the waters. But previous to that, the Spaniards uh, uh, built these channels uh, to um, dry the wetlands. They couldn't because it, it was a lot of water. But with the Lerma system, yes, in the last century, well was uh, well dry. But let me tell you a beautiful story. Yes. When I was growing up, I I was very in touch with uh, with the milpa system. You know, the milpa system is um, a way of production where we grow corn, squash, and beans. And those are called the, you know, sometimes the three sisters, but it's even more because we grow other species uh, in, in the milpa. And we allow for the natural uh, greens to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's the milpa system that until today we, we are keeping in a secret way. There is no much, but the ones that we still are keeping are very beautiful and nice. And we don't just have the milpa system. We are recovering the chinampa system. Mm. The chinampa system is how the uh, Mexica and ancestral Otomi Toltec used to uh, grow food. It's the most efficient system to grow food because it's in the wetlands and you put uh, around some trees and then uh, with, the, with the mud and the earth and the branches, you begin to build this uh, kind of beds mm -hmm. and where you can grow. And it's, it's very efficient. You can grow two, uh, twice a year. You can, you can uh, uh, sit in twice a day and, and pick up twice a day. Twice a year, sorry. So this uh, this is what we are here now. We have wetlands, but my collection began uh, when I was little one, because my grandmother was uh, enlightened by life. Uh, she was a healer. She was a timekeeper, and uh, she was a great healer as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how my lineage uh, is coming from. And also, when I was in the Milpa, when we were, you know, preparing the, you know, the the land for to grow and to to put the seeds, I was finding these special um, figures, and I was very, you know impacted by these figures, and uh, I could feel something special. And these figures were from the ancest ancestors, from my Otomi Toltec ancestors. Uh, and there was a special energy. Uh, I, I felt they were sacred, and they are sacred. So I was putting them on the, uh, on the altar, you know, together with the saints and, you know, we, we could yes. all the signs, but uh, I was more related to this than the Catholic practices. So uh, that's how I began to, to relate that there is much more history in, in my blood, in my surrounding, my territory. So that connection was very strong, but Later on, we were seeing how all the impact, because in the, by the 70s, in 1970s, the industry began to establish in the Toluca Valley. You can name it. 
all kinds of industries, from pharmaceuticals, uh, car industries, all of them. So they began to pollute the river that we had, mm -hmm. the, the river that we have, and they, they uh, made a channel because they didn't respect, because they wanted to dry all around and to establish the industries through the industrial corridors. So that's how uh, we have been impacted by industrialization around, but also about uh, the uh, extract, uh, over exploitation and extraction of waters to supply Mexico City. And supposedly it was just for 50 years. More than 50 years have passed, but, and still they are taking uh, some of the waters. So all of this, it was, a, as I told you, it was an ecocide. And the, the lakes dried up and uh, almost disappeared. That's a suffering. And, and let me tell you something that what happened uh, because we began to practice again our rituals, our ceremonies. Uh, I had to go to other communities to learn with the elders. So the first public ritual ceremony in this region we carry out in 1996. Wow. Was forbidden. That's a long time. 1996. That you had to wait to bring it back, to bring back the ceremony. Yes. And it was demonized. You know, all these practice, practices were demonized because they were saying, oh, you, you are doing evil things and things like that. No, we, we are just taking care and giving care about the sacred and about life, taking care of life, giving care about life for the flourishing of life. Wow. So, in 1996, uh, we carried out the, the first Fiesta por la Vida, the uh, celebration for life. Mm -hmm. And we gathered together the five original peoples from Mexico State. Mexico State is in the center next to Mexico City. It's one of the 30... And one state in Mexico, uh, and it's in central Mexico. And uh, there are other states like, you know, the Yucatan uh, state or the Quintana Roo or Baja California state. And uh, so in here, in central Mexico, is where flourished the ancestral uh, civilizations like the Otomi Toltec, and later on the, uh, the Aztec in the southern part of Mexico, the Mayans, and so on. So the five original peoples we gathered to celebrate life, and we organized that in, in the very beginning of the wetlands, which is called now Almoloya del Rio. And uh, there was no need to to uh, crack the springs because they wanted to administrate, manage the waters underneath. But they produce a lot of destruction, not just in, in the material, but also in the spiritual, because we were related very deeply to the beings and entities. Actually, we have a, a beautiful entity being, which we call Tlanchana Atlanchani, which is called the mermaid in, in English. Okay. But this mermaid is not with fish tail, it's with snake tail. You know, it's, it's a very, very special being. So I'm telling you this because in 1996, in the celebration for life, for life, we gather and we we're giving offerings and payments, spiritual payments, to this being, because we asked to come back for this being and really restore as much as possible the the wetlands and the, the little lakes. Before we had uh, more than forty five thousand hectares 
in, in lakes in, yeah. and not lake. Now we have just uh, 3,200 um, permanent um, waters in the lakes, which are the wetlands here in, in the Sydney Gas de Lerma. But they, oh, they almost disappeared because from 1996 to 1999, we began to carry out studies, science, scientific studies, uh -huh. uh, chemical and uh, physical studies about the wetlands, but also socio-cultural studies. So we could propose to the federal government to protect this, these wetlands. In 1999, because we began to carry out every year the rituals, right? in 1999, the waters came back. The water did. It's right. an amazing story. By the year 2001, we had already prepared all the documents, all the, you know, the basic studies to, to promote this area as a natural protected, protected area of the wetlands. So it was in those years where a federal, um, the federal government in those years uh, acknowledged the, this natural protected area as a federal, um, as a federal place to be protected. So it's what we achieved. And that's how we have worked with science, with culture, and with spirituality. So it is possible to work in that way everywhere around the world. And that's the only way that we can protect life and we can protect species. We can protect biocultural heritage, biocultural memory, and biocultural diversity. Oh, thank you for that story. Um, which I know is not over, it continues. You're getting right at the heart of um, why indigenous wisdom is so important. It's that because you had it, even as a little child, you already know that it's brought from who you are of our relationship. And one of the key things, of course, is to care for ourselves and care for our relatives. And Mother Earth is, or Grandmother Earth, some say, um, you know, is our, our first mother. And so it's caring for all of this. And as you speak, I I can feel your story being so important. Thank you for sharing that, because uh, I know there was some probably real hardship during some of that story, but also great love and the coming together of, of people and nature and spirit, like you were saying, all of it, because that is what the earth is calling out all over the world. And so you're, I thank you because you're modeling that and you, it, no matter what time it is, whether it's a short time or a long time, it's continuing that love that mm -hmm. gets you to make the change to revive the river, to um, revive this, the traditions, the ceremonies that bring that back. So uh, I know that people will want to know a little bit more uh, because when you talk about there's an energy to the ceremonies, to the ancestral objects that you found in the earth, um, and, and then you talk about biocultural. So there's, and this other spiritual energy, this cultural energy. Can you just say a little bit more about what that means and how are you, how are you, um, very much having that lead your work now? Cause it sounds like you, that's very much what you're doing. Yes. Um, let me tell you that this, uh, concept, biocultural diversity, it's very re related to the ancestral wisdom and the ancestral way of being in this world. We as original nations and peoples, we don't, we don't uh, put apart culture and biodiversity. Right. It's intertwined. Connected. They, 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 there cannot be culture without biodiversity. And actually, uh, biocultural, Heritage, biocultural uh, diversity is the coming together, especially with uh, human species. So, in other words, um, there is biocultural 
uh, product, by your cultural produce. Not just in the landscapes or the landscapes, but also around some uh, special species uh, around the the animals and plants. The, in the case of Mexico, we have so many, but I want to uh, to put into attention this uh, being that we call corn, maize, as simply. Or that, because this is a being, and how we can come together with other species is the most marvelous way, and this is beyond beyond anthropocentric thought. Because in the anthropocentric thought, you know, as uh, scholars, mm -hmm. scientists, we all, always say that uh, humans. We are the, the ones who are the highest uh, yeah. intelligent in the like world. Like superior, yeah. Superior and all, all of those. Yeah. That's not, that's yeah. not, it's, you know, <laughs> if we were, we were living with nature, no, from nature. So from, we were living with Mother Earth, not from Mother Earth. As simple as that. And see how much we have lost. How many species in the world? But I want to go back to the to the corn as a sacred being, because the corn in the before being a corn is called um, it's just a grass. It's called teosintle. It's related to the God, to the to the energies. Teosintle is a being of God, but it's a grass. It's a grass that has. Very little, uh, just like in the on the top, like some little grains, but very hard. In the anthropocentric thought, we say that we domesticate as humans, especially in this area in Mesoamerica. My ancestors domesticated. Is that what the scientists say? The uh, this the call. But we know it, it. That's that's true, but it's not the whole truth, because also this grass domesticated us. Mm -hmm. The grass domesticated humans. So the deep connection with this grass, you know, that communication that happens in other levels beyond rationality is sacred. In relationship. So that's how they became together. Actually, in our, our cosmovision, we are the children of the corn. You're the children of the corn? Is that what you said? Okay. It was del maize, children of the corn. Yes. And my grandfather and all the, you know, the elders used to say, don't touch the corn and don't disturb the corn after a certain hour in the in, before that, almost at last, because that this being goes also to sleep. Let's say to sleep in another way. The energies also have to sleep, and we have to respect. It's a being. In the rational uh, thinking, it might sound crazy, but we have to learn how to live. You know, in this sacred relationship. Yes. With the stars, with all beings. So that's, wh that's why we say that this biocultural notion of thinking is beyond uh, the chopping of a, when the science, you know, they chop knowledge. Actually, it's a, it has been a great mistake. Of course, we, we can uh, specialize in something. But without not forgetting yeah. that we are all connected. So, biocultural diversity is the connection between all species and especially humans and other species. That's how we can produce culture, biocultural. Thank meal. you. 
that I'm, I'm sure that'll help everyone because what what I hear you saying, although you have a lineage, so you have this in you, and so do many indigenous people around the world, but that we need all people to be able to connect to the biocultural, that there is a relationship. I can't help, I'm going to just share a quick little story, and then I want to get back into, like, so where are you, you're, you're obviously doing all this in your home, but in sacred sites. But I, I know that um, I have a profound connection in listening to the mountain. I didn't grow up in the mountains, although in Mexico, where my family comes from, they, mm. they, there were mountains around. So, so in reality, although I grew up, I was born in Missouri in the center of the United States, I now live on the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. And when I was down in Ecuador, there was a, a volcano, not, not the big old ones, but a younger one. It was, it was a little, it was active, not mm -hmm. a little bit blowing and some lava and stuff. But I remember one afternoon, and it went on into the evening, I was mesmerized by it. I just couldn't stop. And then, I don't know how to say it. I think it's the energy you're talking about, the relationship that's a spiritual one. I could actually sense and hear the volcano talking to the mountains up here in the north. That it was, it was, you know, it, I couldn't, I was having these visions like it was, I don't know, up in Canada, but in the northwest. Um, I don't know if it was Shasta or somewhere, but in those kind of mountains. And they were talking to each other and they were saying how. They were happy that some people, the people are beginning to remember to light the fire, to remember this connection you're talking about, that we all need for, for life to survive. And then they, then there was some singing. Now I just want to end the story with like, so that happened and I was shared with a few friends that was really uh, amazing to me. But then five years later, I'm in New Mexico doing ceremony with a Peruvian elder and we go into the kiva, and we're sitting in circle, and ceremony begins. And then some of the women, the indigenous women, begin singing. And I began singing with them. And I, they were looking at me really funny, but I just started singing. And, and then after, when we came out of the kiva and that, they said, how, do you, how did you know? And I said, well, that's what I heard the volcano and the, and the mountains in the north sharing with each other. And they go, that's a new song. I said, well, it may be new to us, but we're remembering. I think it's an old song. And so that when you talk about this energy, I, I want, hopefully in people's hearts and minds, they're remembering things that seemed, it's not about just the rational line. This is the illusion of separation is just that, an illusion. Yes. That there, there is great wisdom and beauty and strength for not only now, but for all our relatives, when we listen, when we pay attention, where we are compelled to act just in the way you did since a child, like, this is just who we are. This is not, you know, separating, trying to be higher than, but rather be a part of this hoop of life. So thank you for letting me share that story. It just came so strong from what you were yeah. telling, and I haven't told that story, I don't know, in a long, long time. But I, I have a sense that as you, your books you've written, and not only are you a great um, being in, of the hoop of life and where you grew up, but you're you're traveling to sacred sites all over. Can you tell us a little bit about that and and what what it is about these sacred sites is, that makes it unique to any any place? Because I we were always taught everything is sacred. It doesn't. We don't always operate in sacred rates, human beings, but everything is sacred. All of our relatives. Yes, yeah, it really gives me so much uh, happiness to talk about sacred sites because uh, our Mother Earth, this planet, is a beautiful being, and uh, there are special ley lines in the world that are connected, interconnected from ancestral types. And uh, those places are le like the acupuncture points of Mother Earth. So all that energy that we need as, you know, as animals, as plants and minerals is born from those places. Mm. And, and the fact that they are uh, more special or more sacred 
because uh, as you say, everything is sacred. But there are special places that uh, give us the energy that we need to live in this world. And there are special sounds, special animals, special plants that are also very sacred. In the world, you know, we have, uh, depending on the bioregion, depending on the ecosystem, we have special animals. And that's why we honor those animals and we are related to them. And so to the sacred sites. You were talking about apples, the sacred volcanoes. And of course, they are beings, as the river is a being. And it's beginning to, the world is beginning to understand that they also have spirit. We know and we knew from before. They are beings and they have their own right, inherent right to exist. That's the reason uh, rights of nature and earth jurisprudence is so important. But it has to go beyond the anthropocentric way of thinking because who we are to give the rights to them, they have the right by themselves. They're keeping us alive. <laughs> but still it's a transition that we are uh, carrying out. So sacred sites are the energetic points of Mother Earth that give us this special energy so we can thrive. Not just as humans, all existence. So in those sacred sites, we can find, let's say, more natural, more cultural, and in between. But all of them are biocultural sacred sites. Why? Because even if a volcano is natural, very natural, there are beings related with us and related to the creation, to the creation stories. One, once you name or once you receive the name from those beings in, in the dream time or in the, you know, when you meditate or whatever the connection is through ceremony, they tell us their names. We didn't invent those names. But, but when you impose a new name in, in a sacred site, it's not right. We need to respect the original names because those are the names that were given, given in the ancestral times. Because if you name them in different, it's like if you are called Anita, and if I call you, I don't know, um, Margaret, you are not going to make case to me. That's the reason we need to acknowledge in their own names. Yeah. Okay. It's like so, basic dignity and respect. But, yeah. And continuation of life. I mean, I can't imagine. So tell so these sacred sites that you're going to that are extra special because they have they're like acupuncture, like energy, huge energy. Yes. And I don't know, I are you awakening them? Have they always been awake? Are we listening in a different way? I mean, what actually is happening? And, and why we should care about this. Many things are happening. Many things. Some sacred sites uh, remain secret, in secrecy. Some sacred sites are uh, very public. And actually, they have uh, been converted into touristic attractions. And they have been desecrated. Yeah. And, so, and some sacred sites are in danger. Because of many things, because of mining, because of urban sprawl, because of, um, you know, because just because. Agree, just are, adding more and more and more. Yeah. So the fact is that many things are happening, is that we need to protect them. Protect from, uh, you know, from uh, evils, mm -hmm. things like. You know, I, I'm telling you about um, the mining or the clear cutting because these sacred sites are in the most beautiful places and uh, they hold the most beautiful minerals and metals. That's the reason they are now have many companies are after these sacred sites because they know that there are the so-called rare earths. 
because those ra rare earths is that produce this special energy, mm -hmm. the mineral. And also special species live around. Special trees, special uh, plants, animals, water, special waters, because not all the waters are the same. Right. They are different for different purposes, for different medicine. Okay, so this, uh, we need to protect them because there is no an international regime to protect sacred sites. There are here and there some uh, cases that are beginning to protect them. Like in the case of Uluru in, in Australia, and even in Mexico here, uh, some sacred sites, uh, for example, more cultural, like the pyramids, before people used to go and climb and do whatever they wanted, now it's not possible. If you want to go to Chichen Itza or the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan, it's not possible to just to climb because they are being protected more and more and more. Even though there is not an international regime, but what we are looking for with UNESCO is to establish an international regime to protect those places. Even though uh, they are natural or in between or more cultural, because UNESCO is more for cultural purposes. Mm -hmm. But we know that once we have a sacred relationship, it's cultural. It's a cultural uh, way of being in that sacred relationship with the mountains, with the rivers, with the special uh, caves. You know, there are several, even sacred valleys, like the sacred valley of Tepoztlán, or uh, some places like in, in Asia, in, in, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, that they are so beautiful in, in sacred sites that are also interconnected with the production of rice or the production of other um, the, you know, food systems. But these sacred sites need to be protected because they are the ones that are giving us what we need. Mm. And, and there's something else about the sacred sites. They produce social cohesion because they are the places where we can carry out pilgrimages. We can recover. You know, in the solstices and the equinoxes, we come together to those sacred sites and it's been expanded around the world because it was forbidden before to carry out these ceremonies. Now in, in Mexico, in Peru, in Africa, in Asia, Goodness. you know, we are coming back. Even in, uh, uh, you know, in those places like in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, there's going to be a special, uh, let's say, festival in a kind of uh, structural uh, pyramid. They are bringing artists, scientists, uh, wisdom keepers. But the, the thing is how we relate to them and how this sacred sites can uh, help us really to thrive to, uh, for the flourishing of diversity. In what notion is a process of uni unity, uh, the unification process that we are carrying out? Because we are coming together with them. We are bringing together this energy because sacred sites also need to be acknowledged because they are the place, the places where the entities, the deities dwell. Mm -hmm. You know, they dwell. Many entities, many deities, many, even some caretakers are carrying out this special work. But sometimes they are not acknowledged, and they also need, you know, that reciprocity. That that we also need that sacred connection with them. That's the reason. We need to carry out again pilgrimages to those sacred sites and to acknowledge and carry out ceremony yeah. rituals. As I hear you speaking, um, I'm hoping people are saying that when you talk about relationship uh, or connection, it's much deeper than what than what it's thrown around so loosely. It's really at the the heart of life itself, and that 
um, well, as I hear you talk, um, I can feel your love of, of these sites and, and the urgency to protect them because it's not only protecting them, which needs to be, but protecting all of us because we're all interconnected. And uh, and that if that energy is gone, not only would it hurt two legged as human beings, but it would hurt all our relatives, the, the other the other uh, elements and animals and birds and everything. And then and then I come to our own species. What are we What are we leaving for our children and our children's children and other species children? Um, so these sacred sites, these energy sources, and we are all energy, but these special energy sources. I, I understand a little bit more about why you are so lovingly persistent in this work that you're doing, because it is about life itself. And when you love it as much as like you did a little boy, that place where you grew up, that earth, that water, mm -hmm. you know, that's the greatest thing. And, and it's more than just saying, well, it's love. Well, lo yes, it's love. But remember, love gives life. Yes. And what we're in, hatred and competition and superiority, that doesn't give life. And so I, I really thank you for all of that. And um, I don't want to cut you off because there's more that you want to share about these sites because I know people are very interested in them. We have oh, about another eight minutes or so. So um, if there's anything else you want to say on those, otherwise we'll, we'll go to another area. Yes, just uh, a very short um, notion about sacred sites. And these sacred sites around the world, there are thousands, many, millions of sacred sites, but they are, there are major sacred sites around the world, in every continent, in every region. And those are the ones who are, uh, would need the most um, protection. So in every continent we are, and those are the ones who are uh, being visited. We are going around the world visiting those sacred sites. I just want to mention so Mount Fuji, Mount Etna in Italy, Mount Fuji in Japan, Uluru in, um, in Oceania in Australia, Mount Kailash in Asia, between China. Tibet, here in, in Mexico, there are many, but, you know, sacred sites in the, in the volcanoes of the Popocatépetl yeah. and Isla Cihuac, the sacred valley of Tepoztlán, in, in Peru, in sacred sites like Caral, or the well, very well-known Machu Picchu, uh -huh. and uh, in, in the Southern part, uh, part of the United States, Mount Shasta, Mount Blanca, around the Four Corners, in Greenland, the Big Alps, and uh, in New Zealand, the Southern Island, you know, in those lakes that are giving so much, and around all destruction. Why? We need to recover because from the sacred sites, we can recover the ecosystems, bio regions. We can recover human dignity, mm. the collective human dignity, how we can behave in a good way. Wow. Thank you. That certain message we need is like how we can recover, remember how to protect the dignity of human beings and all the beings. Um, and as you talk and you talk about unification, that you talk about this great diversity of these very important kind of super sacred sites. But as you talk, they feel like, it feels like they're connected. Like it's not, obviously, everything is connected. But in your work, have you found that in your going in prayer and ceremony that it's so obvious that these are all connected. They are all, although some are water, some are mountains, some are, you know, different places, um, that they're all one. Yes. Uh, this interconnection, uh, as we know, and we 
have forgotten, we need to remember. And remember is to come together. And uh, that's true that uh, this competition doesn't allow us, the competition of thinking that there's rationality doesn't allow us to come together. We need to remember to come together as families, mm-hmm. as peoples, as nations, and as a human species. Because we all share this beautiful Mother Earth. We are the children of this being. We cannot live here without this beautiful planet, without the sacred elements. That interconnection, the, you know, the oxygen that we breathe will change. And the sacred fire, the sacred fire is a different manifestation of this energy around the world and in the universe, but we share that as well. The sacred waters. We all humans, plants and animals, even in some minerals, they need this sacred element to survive, to grow. We cannot see even how the crystals grow, but they grow. The rocks also, they grow and, and they also die. But we, we don't have enough time, you know, life to, to see those things, to see those processes. But this unification process that we are talking about is not just about humans coming together. It's about all species, all beings coming together and celebrate life in that way. In, in that way, you know, our way of thinking, the ancestral thought, the ancestral philosophy is to live with Mother Earth and the Father Sky. And to live with Mother Earth and Father Sky is a big responsibility. Because you cannot kill life mm. if you are living with. You are committing ecocide if you are going against life. Yeah. And that's the very reason we have the big chance to remember why we are here as human species. It's not to take over, it's to take care, to give care about life. So life can thrive. And we can thrive. We can transcend because of course we cannot live in the future and we cannot live in the past we can just live now and that's the mystery where we are Mm -hmm. but we can think in the future without forgetting where we come from because if we don't know where we come from we don't know who we are for the beginning and that's why it's important to oversee the future but thinking about the seed. Because, you know, in the rational mind, we always think about this beautiful concept of sustainability, sustainable development, and so on and so forth. It's not enough. Because um, intergenerational equity is rational, is good, because we are thinking what kind of... uh, Earth, what kind of planet, what kind of um, biocultural diversity we are delivering for the future generations. But it's not just that. It's also thinking about what kind of people, what kind of children we are delivering to this world. And that is reciprocity. That is responsibility. That is reconnection. And as my daughter said, that's the very air concept, concept that we need. And I can see the joy, and people watching can see the joy in your body, because it's, it, it is joyful, and it's responsibility. That's, that's just, and so when you're fulfilling your responsibility, then it is joyful life. It's not like, oh gosh, I need to do this. So as I hear you talk, what people can do to support um, this work what would you tell them is, is theirs to do? I think you've already just said some of it. But. Yes, it's just, uh, you know, think about that we cannot live uh, individually. And this notion of me, really in the, in the deep way of thinking, doesn't exist. 
because we have to go from the me to the we in this Western way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Because an individual cannot exist without, without others. There's no way. I'm, I'm, I'm not just thinking about uh, human species. I'm thinking about all species. So the responsibility is to now to recover this human dignity, but recovering family, recovering our communities. The, that interrelationship with families, between families, but also recovering communities and recovering communities is recovering the ancestral names, the ancestral way of doing, producing, and the ancestral way of eating. Because we need also to recover that connection. But also, you know, recovering rituals and ceremonies and songs and arts and handicrafts that give us this way of being in this world. The way of being in this collective way is much better and much more fun <laughs> when you share. Yeah. So we, we need to go from competition to collaboration. Yes. We need to go from... Um, from the me to the we, because we are all interrelated. That's the sacred responsibility in this world that we are holding. And it's a, it's a big responsibility. It's not whatever. Because what we learn in, in the universities, in the schools, is completely different from the notions of the original nations and people's ancestral way of doing, thinking, feeling, and acting. Because this is a collective way. The other is individualistic, egocentric yes. way of thinking, where you can of commodify everything. And it's not a way. Yeah. We need also to come together to rethink our way or being in this world. But there, there as people are listening, they get very clear things we can do to know who we are, look at our ancestor, bring back our communities, our family, but also know we, we're not doing anything alone. That, you know, care for the earth is, you, where do you think your food comes from? What, and it's not only use, but like just even sitting here with you as you talked about, you know, air, just oxygen, the wind. You know, I'm like so grateful when I look at the trees outside, the plant relatives saying, thank you. You know, I put out my carbon and you give me back oxygen. There's nothing. We would not live. And so that unification process that remembering and then actively be involved is what I hear you um, not only promoting, but inviting people to step into that in a really complete way. So it may be a total shifting in terms of time and always bringing in spirituality is not separate. So um, I thank you so much. And um, I know people are going to want to know how to find you. And I want to say, we'll have it written, but it's... Um, uh, the earth, uh, earthelders.org, right? Earthelders.org. And that's where you would be able to learn more about Mandahi and the work and how you can support and support UNESCO in, in, in identifying these sacred sites and making sure that they are secure. Um, and you'll learn much more when you go to that site about what you can do. Um, in closing, Mandahi, I would just, uh, I'd like to give you the opportunity to say whatever else you want to say and I want to leave everyone with what is your dream? What is your dream that we could be a part of helping make happen? People love to help people with their dreams, you know? So what is yours? Yes. Um, my dream is, is around this unification process to come together, to create this intercultural dialogue, intercultural exchange, where companies, multinational, you know, the governments, uh, international governmental organizations, local governments, regional governments can listen to Mother Earth, can listen to the ancestral wisdom keepers, because we are ready to work together. And that's, that's my dream to really to come and we are, this dream is based in the prophecies. But this time the prophecies are not just that they are going to happen because they are going to happen. 
we need to work around the prophecies. And in this case, we are uh, fulfilling our way in this, in this world. We are coming together with um, political leaders, with, um, you know, with people who are powerful uh, philanthropists, but also people who want to go from the transition of taking over to taking care. So we can establish public, public policies for the care of life. And we are ready as original nations and peoples to bring this ancestral wisdom to the world and to the tables. But yeah, not it throws up a little bit. It's that unification. And we all have a role to play in, in that unification. So um, uh, I just thank you so much, Vandahi. It's so wonderful to have this conversation with you. I know that the viewers, the listeners are, are taking it to heart and mind and, um, and, and getting into even more action. Uh, about that. And not only individuals, but collectively to do that. And the institutions that we created and the leaders that we elect to be able to to look at all that in terms of what a relationship are we uh, creating in this world? Are we, are we destroying, making more destruction? So thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. Uh, and I don't know what else to say. I love you. I love those of you who are listening and I love you, Mandahi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on.